Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's web interface support call for ACOs, groups, and virtual groups. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session where attendees will have an opportunity to ask questions via the phone in the support call questions box. CMS subject matter experts will address as many questions as time allows. Also to note, a recording in the slide deck from today's call will be posted on the QPP webinar library within the next few weeks. Now I will turn it over to Lisa Miri Gomez at CMS to begin. Thank you and welcome everyone. I want to thank you today for joining us as groups, virtual groups, and ACOs prepare for quality reporting. Again, I'm Lisa Marie Gomez of CMS, and joining me on the support call today are other experts who will share helpful information regarding the CMS Web Interface Quality Reporting and answer your questions following today's presentation. Today's support call will focus on 2022 CMS Web Interface Quality Reporting. You may contact the Quality Payment Program Service Center with any other questions regarding cost, promoting interoperability, improvement activities, MIPS, or quality reporting in general. Today's slide deck, recording, and transcript will be available on the QPP webinar web library within the next two weeks. Next slide, please. This is a disclaimer slide um, about today's presentation. So information in this presentation is current at the time it is published but I urge you to please be sure that you're using the source documents and links that are provided throughout the presentation. And also please stay tuned to any communication from the Quality Payment Program or the Shared, Shared Savings Program, ACOs, regarding any updated information. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to discuss announcements and reminders. Next slide. The CMS Web Interface will close at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on March 31st, 2023. Your submission will be automatically accepted at, as submission closes. As a reminder, the CMS Web Interface is, accept, is accessible using the sign-in link on the Quality Payment Program website. 2022 is the final performance period for MIPS groups, virtual groups, and 8 p.m. entities to report using the CMS Web Interface, and again, those who are reporting via MIPS. Transition resources are available on the QPP Resource Library and the QPP Webinar Library. The CMS Web Interface will remain as an available collection type only for Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs reporting via the APM Performance Pathway, or also known as the APP, for the 2023 and 2024 performance period. Next slide, please. Here is a list of the upcoming support calls. The next support call will be held on Wednesday, March 8, 2023, from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Topics will include frequently asked measure questions for the following measures. Prev 6, electoral cancer screening. Prev 7, preventative care screening, influenza immunization. And additional topics may be added prior to the support call. Next slide, please. The recording, slides, and transcript from the January 25th, 2023 CMS Web Interface Support Call are available on the QPPR, QPP Webinar Library. Next slide, please. The CMS Web Interface API is available all year for testing in the developer preview environment. Please review the links listed here for more information. Now I will turn the presentation over to Katie Moore who will review frequently asked measure questions. Katie? Thank you, Lisa Marie. Next slide, please. So the first measure that we're going to cover today is CARE 2 fall screening for future fall risk. And as a quick overview, the intent of this measure is to screen patients 65 years of age and older for future fall risk during the measurement period. In regard to the use of telehealth for CARE 2, a screening for future fall risk may be completed during a telehealth encounter. Next slide, please. Now we'll review some of the frequently asked measure questions. Question one is what documentation needs to be captured for non-ambulatory patients to be excluded from the 2022 CMS Web Interface CARE 2 measure? 
And the answer is that the denominator exclusion for non-ambulatory patients was removed from the measure during the annual update and rulemaking cycle. The expectation is that a fall screening is completed during the measurement period for each eligible patient. Question two is who can perform the screening for future fall risk for the 2022 CMS Web Interface Care 2 measure? The measure isn't limited to a particular clinician type. The quality action can be completed by anyone the organization considers qualified. Question three, is documentation of a fall screening performed inpatient or in the emergency department acceptable for the 2022 CARE 2 measure? The answer is yes. The measure isn't limited to a particular setting. Next slide, please. Question four is what clinical information should be recorded in the medical record to reflect the intent of the 2022 CARE 2 measure? The answer is that screening for future fall risk is an assessment of whether an individual has experienced a fall or problems with gait or balance. A specific screening tool isn't required for this measure. However, potential screening tools include the Morse fall scale and the time to get up and go test. The numerator guidance within the measure specification states that the following, documentation of no falls is sufficient. The medical record must include documentation the screening was performed. Any history of falls during the measurement period is acceptable as meeting the intent of the measure. A gait or balance assessment meets the intent of the measure. If after reviewing the medical record, you find supporting documentation that meets the numerator guidance criteria, then it would, be, then it would meet the intent of this measure. Next slide. Next, we're gonna discuss PREV-10, preventative care and screening, tobacco use screening, and cessation intervention. The intent of this measure is to screen patients 18 years and older for tobacco use one or more times within the measurement period and to provide tobacco cessation intervention on the date of the encounter or within the previous 12 months as ident if identified as a tobacco user. For the use of telehealth with PREV-10, screening for tobacco may be completed during a telehealth encounter. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to go over some frequently asked questions for PREV-10. Question one is for the 2022 CMS Web Interface PREV-10 um, measure, what is needed to satisfy the screening portion of the measure? The response is, if a clinician has documented a status for any type of tobacco use, this includes non-smoker smokes or uses smokeless tobacco, that meets the performance requirement for the screening component of the measure. Question two, does the measure include electronic cigarettes or vaping as tobacco use or tobacco cessation? The answer is no. The intent of the measure is to screen for tobacco use for products that burn or use tobacco leaves. The United States Preventive Services Task Force concludes that current evidence is insufficient to recommend electronic nicotine delivery systems for tobacco cessation. Question three, there are three rates and population categories. Which rate or criteria is used for performance scoring for the 2022 performance period? The rate for population two, tobacco users received tobacco cessation intervention is used for performance. Next slide. Question four is who can complete the tobacco cessation intervention within our organization? For example, can a medical assistant provide counseling to patients or does it need to be an eligible clinician? Tobacco cessation counseling can be provided by anyone your organization deems qualified. Question five, what if the patient had more than one tobacco use screening during the measurement period? Which one do we use? In the instance there's more than one tobacco use screening during the measurement period, you would use the most recent query during the measurement period to determine tobacco use status. Question six, does the tobacco use screening that was done in the emergency department or inpatient count? The answer is yes. 
this measure isn't limited to a particular setting. Next slide, please. Question seven is, did the time frame in which patients should be screened for tobacco use and receive tobacco cessation intervention change for the 2022 performance period? The answer is yes. The measure previously assessed tobacco use and tobacco cessation intervention within a 24 month look back period. During the annual measure update process, the sub substantive changes were made to the 2022 CMS Web Interface PREV 10 measure were identified in the calendar year 2022 PFS final rule and reflected in the 2022 CMS Web Interface PREV 10 measure specifications. The measure was changed to require screening for both tobacco use at least once during the measurement period and tobacco cessation intervention on the date of the encounter or within the previous 12 months from the screening encounter date. Next slide. Okay, I will hand things back to Lisa Marie to go over resources and where to go for help. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. So next slide, please, thank you. So please note that the 2022 submission resources are available on the Quality Payment Program Resource Library. We encourage you to review these documents if you have questions on quality requirements and measures. We'll continue to communicate any future postings on upcoming support calls. Next slide, please. So for those, um, so for those transitioning to another collection type for the 2023 performance period and beyond, resources are available on the QPP Resource Library and QPP Webinar Library. As previously noted, the 2022 performance period is the last year in which the CMS Web Interface um, is available to groups and virtual groups participating in MIPS. So thus, starting with the 2023 performance period, Groups and virtual groups that previously reported via the web interface will need to report quality measures using a different collection type. And again, the Shared Savings Program ACOs reporting the CMS web interface measures under the APP, the CMS web interface will be available for the 2023 and 2024 performance period. Next slide, please. So this slide contains links to resources available for the Shared Savings Program ACOs, and we encourage you to review the materials available here for more information. Next slide, please. If you need additional assistance, please refer to the contact information listed on this slide. Now I will turn the next portion of the support call to Olivia to begin the Q&A session. Great, thank you, Lisa Marie. And yes, now we are going to begin the Q&A portion of today's call. And just a reminder, you can ask questions two ways. You can ask a question via the webinar audio. And if you click that raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, we will unmute your line. And you can also submit a question through the Q&A box and we will read it out loud. So just looking at the Q&A box, we'll start with a couple of questions that have come in so far. The first says, our beneficiary sample has a patient who is identified as female, but according to our EMR, patient is male. Patient is in the breast cancer screening measure. How should we handle it? Hi, this is Joyce Bay from RTI Answering. So generally, CMS considers the patient's gender at birth for inclusion in the denominator. And if there's an instance where a patient was sampled for the measure, but you don't believe they should have been, for example, they were born male, but identify as or have transitioned to female, um, we suggest that you submit a request for an other CMS approved reason to skip the patient. And then CMS will evaluate each request on a case by case basis. And just to note that if a patient's demographic information is incorrect, it can be fixed within the CMS web interface. You can find out how to do that via the CMS web interface user guide in the QPP resource library. But note that any demographic information you change in the CMS web interface doesn't get reported back to the Medicare patient enrollment database. So, if that needs to be updated, then your patient should contact the Social Security Administration directly to update that information. Great. 
Great. And one more question that came in on PREV 13. For PREV 13 population number two, familial hypercol, if the patient has a general E78 code, but not the E78.01 code, um, but they have it in their family history section of the EMR, a patient or sibling who has a lipid disorder, can that count out to the patient into population number two? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, no, that wouldn't count. The patient must have a diagnosis of familiar familial hypercholesterolemia, which is the E78-01 code, which that code is included in the denominator codes in the PREV 13 coding document. Thank you. Great, and we will give it another minute. Um, just a reminder, you can submit a question through the Q&A box, or if you would like to um, ask it live, you can raise your hand and we will unmute your line. One question that just came in, would tobacco cessation intervention in an ED or inpatient setting meet the measure? Um, for tobacco, it is not setting specific. So those settings would be applicable um, for doing cis screening or and or uh, cessation if the patient's found positive for smoking tobacco. Thanks. Great, and it looks like we do have someone with their hand raised. Sandra, we will unmute your line and you can ask your question. And you may have to unmute on your end too. Thank you, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great, thank you so much. So the question is around the fall screening for, fall screening for future fall risk. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of confusion since the um, exception of, you know, ambulatory um, has been removed. And, you know, I guess really, what is the process that is sort of expected? If a patient's non-ambulatory, are we just asking them if they've fallen? I mean, is, I guess I'm not really clear on what CMS wants us to get from someone who is truly non-ambulatory. And this is Deb from the PIMS team, and I'll just answer from the perspective of the, the measure specification. When that measure developer um, put that measure together, they did remove that exclusion um, exception. And so the, the best that we can provide is that your medical record documentation needs to support whatever you report. And the fact that a patient is non-ambulatory um, no longer means that you should be removing that patient, that a false screen should be completed on them. Um, you can certainly, if you find that you have a non-ambulatory patient and you feel like you want to request a CMS approved reason to skip that patient, you are welcome to do that. Um, but, but we can only provide the guidance that you should be looking um, at that measure specification and submitting data that you have the medical record documentation to support um, what's being requested. All right, thank you. Thank you. Great, and we did receive a couple of other questions in the Q&A box. Um, this first one is on PREV 7. It says provider documented at May 2022 visit that the patient is not up to date with the flu vaccine and the patient declined. This documentation was completed after the flu season ended. Can we use this for an exception? Hey, and thank you so much for this question. I have to say we had to go digging for this one for a second. So thanks for submitting it. Um, you may document patient refusal exception previous receipt after March 31st, but the medical records should note that the refusal exception previous receipt 
occurred during the appropriate time frame. Um, so then insert the um, flu season that it would apply to. So thanks for submitting that question. We had to go scramble for that one. Good question. Thank you, Jamie. And a couple of other questions came in for you. Um, the next one says for the tobacco screening, if the only documentation in the EMR states currently does not smoke, is that sufficient for the measure? Yeah, that's a good question too. In regards to the documentation, and we can't be really specific about how you should have that information represented within the medical chart that you're reviewing. Um, but as long as it's clear to you that, you know, the patient's been screened and that was the outcome, then that suffices um, for the measure, for the, meeting the intent of the measure. Thanks. Thank you. In one question on PREV 10, it says if a patient is identified as a smoker and the provider adds patient is not ready to quit, does that count as tobacco cessation? Yeah, thank you also for this question. Another really good question. Um, the intent of this measure is that we just identify those patients um, and screen them. And if they're found to be positive for tobacco, um, then we're providing the cessation. But performance for the measure isn't necessarily tied to the patient actually quitting. It's really just the screening and that cessation is provided. Um, and that's really all it is there. So if that patient decides that they're not going to quit, that is not. Um, that doesn't harm you for performance in the measure. And what I would reference is that there's a definition for tobacco cessations. Um, uh, it's briefly, it's a brief uh, counseling, I think three minutes or less, and I should probably pull this back up. I'm going off of my brain here, but by all means, please go back to that specification. Just look at the definition there and that should provide you some more guidance. Thanks. Great. And the next question reads, since CMS is suppressing quality measures that include at least three ACO measures, what guidance can be provided regarding how these measures will be evaluated? Can you repeat the question? Of course. It says, since CMS is suppressing quality measures that include at least three ACO measures, what guidance can be provided regarding how these measures will be evaluated? I'm not sure if the person's referring to web interface measures or ACQM or CQM measures, but in regard to the CMS web interface measures, there are two measures that do not have a benchmark, MH1 and PREF 13. When a measure does not have a benchmark, those measures are not scored as long as reporting requirements are met for those measures. So again, for the CMS web interface measures, MH1 and PREF 13, those measures do not have a benchmark. Therefore, they will not be scored as long as reporting requirements are met for those measures. There are not any other measures for CMS web interface measures that are suppressed. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Marie. And our next question says, what if we don't have a PHQ-9 from last year for MH1? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. I will take that one. So I think what this question is asking is if the patient had a appropriate diagnosis, but they didn't have a PHQ-9 from that denominator identification period. So that would be the November 1st, 2020 to October 1st, 2021. So um, when you get into the denominator confirmation um, portion, you're first asked if the patient had uh, an appropriate diagnosis, of major depression or dysthymia during the denominator identification period. And then um, in second question is you would determine if the patient had one or more PHQ-9s during the denominator identification period. So at that point, if they did not have the PHQ-9 administered, you would um, select no um, and they would not be included in the um, denominator population. Um, but 
if you have additional questions, feel free um, to send those um, through the Q&A or submit a ticket to qpp at cms.hhs.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And one more question that came in for you. We are seeing a lot of skips for PREV 13 because it doesn't fit any of the criteria, but through abstraction, we are finding out that they have description of hyperlipidemia and are on statins. Are patients being included in the sample because they are taking a statin no, and not because they meet criteria? I, so um, the patients would be sampled um, based on the denominator uh, criteria, not based on what's required from the numerator. So. Um, you can refer to the sampling methodology and perhaps if there's more someone from the RTI can RTI team can jump in and fill in a little bit more, but um, patients are sampled based on having the appropriate numbers of encounters and the appropriate diagnoses. Um, so if you're not able to confirm the diagnosis as they're specified within the measure, um, the patient may not um, be appropriate for the denominator. So you would truly be looking for those patients um, with the familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, hyperlipidemia is not included um, as a diagnosis for inclusion in the measure. Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to go back to the phone just for one question. Renee Williams, we have unmuted your line and you will just need to unmute on your end. Okay. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, last um, call two weeks ago, there was a mention of uh, the initial beneficiary sample list that we download from the CMS web interface, that there might have been some issues with it, and there were going to be some emails coming out within the next two weeks advising us what we might need to do. I haven't seen anything. Did I, I misunderstand? Did oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 you're correct. So I want to, so when you, if you were in the actual, like the web interface portal itself and you downloaded your sample, like you're okay. There's nothing wrong with, with your sample or what you downloaded from the actual web interface portal itself. Um, the issue was with regard to um, the Excel templates that were posted to the resource library. Those were, um, there was a blank template that could be utilized, and there was like an, an example um, of an interface template, and those where we actually made changes to it. The the email that will be sent actually will be sent out today, so you have not missed it. <laughs> so you will receive them today. And um, otherwise, again, if you downloaded within the portal itself, the web interface portal, you're you're fine. There was nothing wrong there. It's just under the resource. Um, the resource library where we added Excel templates there, that, those, that's where we made the changes. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Sure, no thank you. Sense. Sure. Great. And turning back to the Q&A box, um, the next question is on PREV 10. Does the within the previous 12 months for cessation intervention mean the calendar year or 12 months prior to the screening date? For example, screened and identified as a tobacco user, November 1st, 2022, what would the 12 months be? Hi, thanks for submitting this question. And that is, it's not gonna be based on the calendar year, it's gonna be based on the previous 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And the next, co uh, the next question, excuse me, says, is the CPT code sufficient for tobacco cessation counseling? So in order um, to meet the intent of that measure, that information would have to be documented within the medical record. So the CPT code on its own, it's not gonna suffice. We're really looking to see if that medical record um, carries the same information um, that you've reported within the web interface tool. Thanks. Great, and a couple more questions for you, Jamie. The next one, to confirm tobacco screening will only be accepted within 2023, not including 2022? Yeah, this question, I'm sorry for the, the person who submitted this question. I'm not sure I'm quite following. So 
by all means, please feel free to resubmit the question, um, raise your hand on the call and we can have a quick discussion or submit it um, as a service now inquiry and we can definitely address it. But I just wanna confirm that um, these questions today, they're for the 2022 web interface submission. Um, and so you would um, be able to look within 2022 or possibly back into 2021 um, for any of that information to meet the intent of the measure. But again, if I'm not following this question, by all means, please provide a clarification and I'll do my best to support it. Great. The next question, Jamie says, would a statement warning the patient to quit smoking on a discharge summary be sufficient for PREV 10 intervention? Yeah, thanks for uh, uh, posting this question into the Q&A chat. I, what I went ahead and did is I, I'm looking at the specifications currently, and I'm in those definitions, as I said earlier, for that tobacco cessation intervention. Um, and so the definition of that within the measure specification is that it includes brief counseling, three minutes or less, and or pharmacotherapy. So um, what that means is that we're really going to be looking to see if that brief counseling was performed and um, I'm not sure, again, it's hard for us to speak to medical record documentation um, in an isolated example like that, which really is that whole, um, either that patient's chart or that note for that day that really gives us the insight. But in this instance, we're really going to be looking for that kind of interaction occurring, and that would meet the intent of the definition found within the specification. Thank you. Great. And the next question says, if there's a telephone note that a patient has declined the flu vaccine and it is between October and March, would that count as a definition since it was not asked or documented in a visit? So as long as there's medical record documentation, if that telephone note is documented in the medical record um, and it's present and it can be accounted for, then that would, that would meet the intent of the measure and medical record documentation. Great. And Angie, a couple of questions for you. Would PDF documents within the EMR be acceptable documentation for a patient to meet a specific measure? For example, depression screening. Hi. Um, yes, any documentation in the patient in the patient's medical record can be used. And of course, it, in the case of a depression screening, it would need to have um, all of the components listed in the measure specifications, but if it's in the medical record, it can be used. Thanks. Thank you. And another question for you, Angie, would an assisted living facility count as a long-term care facility for the purpose of exclusion from PREV 5 and PREV 6 measures? Um, no, it wouldn't. Um, you can find this information on page one of the measure specifications, but uh, the exclusion for patients age 66 and older that reside in long-term care um, would need a place of service code of 32, 33, 34, 54, or 56 um, and be in that long-term care um, more than 90 consecutive days during the measurement period. So it would have to be a long-term care place of service code. Thanks. Great. Right. And one question on PREV 12 specifically says, would you review the final interpretation on the PREV 12 exclusion timing? Hi, this is Katie. Um, so for the denominator exclusion timing in regard to PREV 12 is the denominator exclusion is assessed prior to any encounter during the measurement period. So a diagnosis of depression or bipolar during the measurement period wouldn't be considered a denominator exclusion. Thank you. Thank you. And Jamie, a couple more questions have come in for you. The first one, why isn't the tobacco cessation measure in the screening for depression and follow-up plan not resulted in the same way? Um, this is a good question. Thanks for submitting it. Um, each of these measures have their own measure stewards, and um, these, both these measures have been in the program for a long time. Um, uh, depression screening um, is, is 
a CMS based measure. So we can take that feedback and, and look at that and see if that's a possibility for a potential revision in the measure. Um, but tobacco was owned by AMA um, and then PCPI now is owned by NCQA. And so any questions or any time that there's questions in regards to those measures, we would encourage folks to go ahead and reach out to those measure stewards to provide um, those types of uh, potential updates to the measures. They can be considered, but um, that's one of those ways to sort of manage it. But it's it's the rationale behind why the measures are are set up differently. Um, there's two different stewards at play here, um, and it's just how that measure was tested and developed. So thanks for the question. Thank you. And Jamie, we did get a request just for some clarification um, on a, a previously asked question on PREV 7. Um, the question was the provider documented it in the May, 9, the May 2022 visit that the patient is not up to date with the flu vaccine and the patient declined. This documentation was completed after the flu season and ended. So can they use this as an exception? Can you repeat that question, please? Yes, of course. Um, it's PREV 7 provider documented at May 2022 visit that the patient is not up to date with the flu vaccine and the patient declined. This documentation was completed after the flu season ended. And can they use this for an exception? Hi, Katie. I was on mute. I'm so sorry. I was, <laughs> nobody can hear me when I talk on mute. Um, sorry about that, folks. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and repeat that response. And then additionally, there are uh, several other questions that are below that we're asking for clarification on this uh, specific topic. So I'm hoping that this answer sort of helps everybody. But again, um, by all means, please uh, resubmit this question or raise your hand um, or submit that service now inquiry and we can we can get this clarified for folks. Um, but it's, you may document patient refusal exception previous receipt after March 31st, but the medical records should note that the refusal exception previous receipt occurred during the appropriate time frame. So within PREV 7, and I'm going to go to that specification right now, um, there's time frames for the flu season in which you can have that, um, you're looking for that quality action or what the outcome was. Um, for that particular patient within your sample. And those timeframes are August 1st of um, 2021 and through March 31st of 2022. And so basically the guidance that we're providing with this response is that you can go ahead and find that documentation after the flu season, but you're gonna have to reference that timeframe within that 2022 um, web interface measure specification. I hope that clears it up for folks. Great. And Deb, a question for you. Um, why are schizophrenia and psychosis exclusions for MH1, but not PREV12? This is Deb. Very similar to a previous um, response that Jamie provided um, on two different measures. These measures are owned by different measure stewards. Um, and the intent of the measures are different. So they have been developed by the, the each of the individual measure stewards. Um, to, to, to address a specific need. So for the PREV-12 measure, that is a depression screening measure, um, much different than MH1, which is a, a measure where you have depression identified and you are looking for remission. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question says, does a PhD Q2 score of zero require documented interpretation when historically a score of zero indicates negative screen and or no depression. Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So with regard to um, medical record documentation, we can't advise specifically as to how something um, must appear in your documentation. Um, just you need to have information that supports what you've reported through the CMS web interface. So as long as um, you can support that you've met all components of the measure, 
um, the screening was performed, what the results were, and that a follow-up is documented. If the screening was positive, um, then that should be sufficient. Um, but again, um, we can't speak to your exact medical record documentation or what specifically should be included. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And one more question that came in for the MH1 measure, we are seeing that codes that were changed in late 2022. For example, we have noticed that F32, which is included in the 2022 coding document, is changed to F32.A, which is not part of the coding document and is described as an unspecified depression. Can you provide guidance on how, on how to properly report on this measure? Sure. So when we're reporting through the CMS web interface, um, in, in any instance, coding alone isn't considered sufficient documentation. So you have to have supporting medical record documentation to show that the patient had the appropriate um, diagnosis or, um, you know, the appropriate components of the measure um, to be included. So um, as long as you have that information supporting a diagnosis, um, then you wouldn't need to have the specific codes. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll just take a moment to pause here. Just in a quick reminder, if you do want to submit a question, please go ahead and do so through the Q&A box, or you can also raise your hand and we will unmute your line and you can ask the question live. Um, we did just get another question on PrEP 6. It says, patient care from our facility, patient transferred care from our facility on September 16th, 2021, and was last seen here on December 14th, 2020. It was documented that she declined the colonoscopy. Can she be excluded? And this is Deb from the PIMS team, and I can only answer one um, component of this. Um, and then I think it's probably RTI that can answer the other piece as far as when patients are sampled. Um, you would not be able to take um, declining a colonoscopy in 2020 um, for an exclusion. So in this particular case, um, I'm not speaking to the transfer of care per se, but if you were looking at documentation from 2020, um, you cannot use that documentation as declining the colonoscopy. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And Katie, a question for you on MH1. It says our system will trigger a PHQ-9 according to how the PHQ-2 is answered. If a patient has answered PHQ-2-PHQ-9, that was previously positive, but all visits thereafter, the patient had a, a PHQ twos that were zero or one, then a follow-up PHQ nine will not trigger as a positive for depression. Our follow-up PHQ twos an appropriate way to prove remission. Hi, so um, the criteria to meet this measure is based on um, the PHQ-9. So they would need to have the PHQ-9 rather than the PHQ-2 to determine remission um, for the patient. Um, and just to clarify, so a PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M is required for um, both um, the denominator identification period, and then also to determine remission. Thank you. Thank you. And we did get a question on PREV7. It says, also for PREV7, does the CPT code G8482 satisfy the measure, even if the dates are not documented in the chart? So this is Deb. Um, for PREV7 and for any of the other measures as identified and, and spoken to previously by some of the other PIMS colleagues, um, coding alone is not sufficient for, for any of the measures. You need to have medical record documentation that supports what you're reporting. 
Um, for PrEP 7, the one thing to keep in mind that is a little bit different is if you have information that is pre-filled. You don't have to go back and verify that pre-filled information, um, but, but coding itself should not be used to confirm. It can be used, however, to help you find the appropriate documentation in your medical records. Thank you. Thank you. And another question on PREV7 says the sample file is pre-populated with data for a few patients. If we cannot evidence of immunization in our EMR, can we still mark the patient as compliant based on the data provided by CMS? Hi, this is Kara with RTI. The claims data can be used to support your quality reporting. However, the data reported through the CMS web interface must be documented in the beneficiary's medical record. Claims data is used to pre-populate PREV7. However, ACOs will be asked to confirm that the sample beneficiary has documentation of the vaccination in the medical record. Thank you. Great, thank you. And then a clarifying question, um, could you please clarify if a PHQ score of zero can be inferred as negative, or does the provider have to specify negative or positive regardless of the score? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So um, again, when submitting data through the CMS web interface, it's expected for reporters to retain that supporting medical record documentation demonstrating the patient met the denominator criteria, the numerator quality action was performed, and or any other applicable denominator exclusions or exceptions existed. So we can't provide specific feedback regarding whether or not documentation or specific wording in a patient's medical chart would meet the intent of the measure. Um, you have to be able to support the information that you report. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is about PREV10. It says, if a patient has been screened multiple times, do we use the most recent screening for the 12 month look back for counseling? Hi, this is Jamie. Thanks for this question. And yes, you would use that most recent screening for that 12 month look back to determine if cessation was provided. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And we are going to switch over to the phone line. Sandra, we have unmuted your line and you may just need to unmute on your end to ask your question. Thank you. I, I just wanted to circle back on PREV7 because I'm looking at the CMS guidance under numerator guidance note. And it says if the CMS web interface has been pre-filled with yes based on claims data, no further action is required. Yet the previous response was, we still have to validate the information in our medical record. So it's a conflicting guidance in my mind when, when the print and guidance is saying nothing further is required. Could you just speak to that again, please? Yeah, this is Carol with RTI. Um, I think we may need to follow up on this one with a help desk ticket. Um, you know, generally the the claims data is used as a mechanism to help you identify where to look for the documentation, um, but is still necessary that the the it be duplicated within the medical record. Yeah, I understand that for most of the measures, but since influenza, the guidance specifically tells you no further action is required in print. I'm just curious as to now, you know, the reason for the last response of being you still have to validate it in the record. Because to me, if CMS has, you know, a claim that the, the, the flu vaccine has been given somewhere, that's why you're pre-populating it, right? Um, I don't know, it's just, it's just confusing, you know, to be on the user end and have conflicting information like this, it's, it's challenging. And now we're almost at the end of collection period. So, <laughs> or halfway through. Um, so just, you know, kind of not really clear. And I don't think it's just me. I mean, I don't have a specific, you know, 
ticket to put in. I mean, I just think that I heard your last answer and now I'm really kind of confused. I wasn't before. This is Deb from the PIMS team. I would make a recommendation. Um, it has been in the last several years that the one exception, um, as, you've, as you've kind of alluded to, the one exception within the web interface that allows um, that whatever is pre-filled, <clears throat> that it doesn't require anything additional is that PREV7 measure. It is the only measure within the web interface that has a pre-filled response. Right. Um, so I, I don't know, Lisa Marie, if you're okay, I, I think that, that going by what is in the posted measure specification is accurate. Um, but we can take it back. And if for some reason there is something that is incorrect, we can bring it back to the next support call. But to be honest, I think you are, anyone who has used that pre-filled information and not gone back into the medical records to try and confirm what's pre-filled, that is acceptable. That is how PREV7 has worked over many years. Um, and then we can just come back if for some reason that's not the case, but, but I don't believe that you will have to do anything different for PREV7. And as I said, it is supported by what is in the posted specification. Thank you, Deborah. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And as I've noted, if we, um, if we, there is anything that we need to clarify during the next support call, we will. So again, thanks, Deb, for answering that question. Great. And then just going back to a couple of other questions that we have received, um, Angie, a question for you says, what is the reasoning behind the depression remission follow-up PHQ-9 timeframe? Hi. Um, the the reason for that is to allow time um, for follow-up um, so that depression remission could occur. Um, so they do allow um, that time frame and um, let's see here for that that is the measure assessment period and the measure steward feels that that is a good length of time to allow for for follow-up and to hopefully get a patient into remission. Thanks. Thank you. And Joyce, a question for you says we have included, we have included as not qualified for sample, non-fee-for-service Medicare for supplemental insurers, as well as the government health plan TRICARE. Can you kindly confirm that TRICARE should not be qualified for sample? Also, are there dual eligible in the sample Medicare and Medicaid? Sure. So if the primary coverage was not Medicare fee-for-service for at least some portion of the measurement period, then it's appropriate to exclude the patient. And TRICARE does not qualify in this case, so it would be sort of exclusion. And in, it is possible for dual eligibles to be in the sample, but Medicare should still be the primary insurer for the entire medical period. Thank you, Joyce. Katie, a couple of questions for you. The first one reads, if a patient declines a breast cancer screening, or colorectal screening, can they be submitted to, to be excluded from the measure? Hi, so um, there are a few questions coming in similar to this. So um, for both of these measures, there are no exclusions um, for patient refusal. So um, regardless of the year that any refusal occurred, um, it's not an appropriate exclusion for the measure. The expectation is if the patient is eligible for the denominator that the quality action was performed. Um, and then just a, a general reminder. So any specific exclusions for each measure would be specifically outlined um, within the measure specification. So if um, you're wondering if a particular measure includes patient refusal for um, a certain scenario, we definitely encourage you to take a look at those measure specifications just to confirm. Um, if you still have questions, please submit those to qpp at cms.hhs.gov and we can help you work through that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the next question is just looking for clarification. 
it says, can you please confirm for performance year 2022, PREV 12, if PHQ2 is an acceptable screening for the numerator? Hi, so um, the measure specification does list example um, depression screenings that would be in, um, appropriate for the measure. Um, so if you take a look at page five of the 2022 PREV 12 spec, um, it does provide a listing of appropriate screenings. Um, the prime MD PHQ2 is listed there. And then just to know um, the listing within the measure specification isn't considered um, to be exhaustive. Um, these are just example screenings, um, but the measure is not limited to those that are listed there. Uh, you would just need to ensure that the screening is considered a normalized and validated depression screening tool developed for the patient population in which it's being utilized. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Deb, a quick question for you. It says, can gait and mobility abnormal coded in the problem list count for CARE 2, documentation of gait? Thank you. Um, so the CARE 2 measure specification does define a screening for future fall risk as an assessment of whether an individual has experienced a fall or problems with gait or balance. So as long as your medical doc record documentation supports that the patient was assessed for problems with gait or balance, the intent of the measure has been met. Um, and then there is some additional guidance, pretty much the same as what I just shared in the posted measure specification, if you want to go back to that to refer to it. But again, as long as your medical record documentation supports that the patient was assessed for problems with gait or balance, then you would have met the intent of the measure. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Deb. Um, the next question says, in MH1, if medication is given for depression, but it is not mentioned or seen in an office visit during the measurement period, can it still be used as a diagnosis for depression? Hi, this is Angie. Um, so for MH1, you're looking for the diagnosis, um, an active diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia during the denominator ident identification period and not the measurement period. Um, the denominator identification period is November 1st, 2020 through 1031, 2021. So that's where you're looking for that diagnosis, as well as um, a PHQ-9. Um, I think it's over nine. I'll have to look. Anyway, you need both the diagnosis and the PHQ-9 during that November 20 through October of 2021 time period for the patient to be included in the measure. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take a, take a pause here. Um, if you do have a question, please go ahead and submit it through the Q&A box or raise your hand um, and we will unmute your line. And it looks like we did just get a question on PREV 7. It says, I am a retired medical director for our group who has been the only one to do quality measures since we started in 2015. I am almost done, so this issue of having to go back and make sure that the flu shot is in the chart after a pre-filled report is difficult. Can we get an answer on this, please? Yes, this is Deb, and I'm going to go back and, and point back to the PREV 7 measure specification, which does provide the guidance that if you have pre-filled information on PREV 7, you do not have to look any further to confirm that pre-filled data is accurate. Um, I will say, as, as our CMS lead, Lisa Marie Gomez said, if something, um, if there is something missing that we need to share, we will share that with the group as soon as possible. We know that, that this has um, kind of caught folks off guard, but I, I would say there is very little chance that that previous direction will have changed, especially in light that the um, guidance is provided in the posted specification. Um, so again, I would I would go ahead and continue to do what you're doing that is supported by the spec, which is for the PREV 7 measure, if you have anything that has been pre-filled, um, you don't have to verify the medical record documentation. It is the only measure within the web interface that has pre-filled data. Um, certainly, there, you know, 
if, if you had to find it, the expectation, or not the expectation, but I'm sure the medical record documentation would support it um, as, as it's been found and pre-filled. But, but to go back at this point, um, I would say you don't have to do that unless something um, is, is communicated by CMS in the very near future. Thank you. Um, and actually, I will, I will also say that it is in CMS's web interface FAQ document. Um, so there, there's a couple of different places where not having to go back um, and, and verify that information that's been pre-filled, um, you can look at for, for continuing to do what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And we will give it another minute. If you do have a question, please go ahead and submit that or raise your hand um, and we will give you a minute or so to do so. And it looks like we do have someone with their hand raised. Angela Farley, we will unmute your line and you'll just have to unmute on your end as well. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, well, I put a question in the chat uh, and you hadn't got to it yet. So I just wanted to see if I could get it answered before the call ended. Uh, the comment was made that we, the depression screenings that were listed is not an exhaustive list and that we just needed to make sure that the depression screenings were standardized. How would you suggest that we verify that a depression screening is a considered a standardized test? Uh, I had submitted a help desk ticket earlier uh, for a practice in Oklahoma that is using the Sooner Care Behavioral Health, uh, which is a standardized tool for their behavioral health screen that's required by Medicaid, and they wanted to use that uh, for their depression screening, but I couldn't get an answer as to whether it was considered standardized or not. Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So. Um, Outside of the information provided in the measure specification, um, you know, it would be up to the organization to determine uh, if the screening tools that they're using meets the definition provided within the spec. So um, outside of those that are listed there, again, um, we would just encourage you to make sure that you're meeting that definition, that the screening tool is normalized and validated, depression screening tool developed for the patient population in which it's being utilized. We um, you know, can't confirm a specific type of screening that's acceptable for the measure um, outside of those that might be listed here, other than um, noting that the list isn't exhaustive. Okay, and then just turning back to the Q&A box, Angie, a question for you on PREV 5 and PREV 6. It says the patient reported requirement, date and, excuse me, date and type of test and results slash finding. Patient reported mammograms when recorded in the medical record are acceptable for meeting the numerator. Patient reported a negative bilateral mammogram with date, but we are not able to get the medical record. Hi, um, so, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure what AWB is, um, but if these are, you don't need the actual result. I'm thinking this might be asking if you need the actual negative bilateral mammogram results. Um, it says they're not able to get the medical record. So maybe submit a ticket on that and I can, um, be more specific with a little more detail um, from this inquiry, but um, it is acceptable for the numerator to have the patient reported. And it can be, we need the date and type of test um, to determine, you know, if the screenings are current. 
and the result or finding, which can just be uh, patient reported as normal or or um, or or abnormal. So I hope that helps answer that. But if not, please submit a ticket. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. The next question for PREV 13, population two, can we confirm a diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia if the only place it is documented is when, when associated with lab or medication orders? Hi, this is Katie. So again, this would be another instance um, where you know we can't specifically tell you how to document, um, just that you need to be able to have the medical record documentation to support the information provided. So, um, you know, if what you've referenced is considered part of your medical record documentation, um, then it would be appropriate to include them, but you would need to be able to verify the patient met all the denominator criteria and have the documentation to support that. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll just do one more call here to see if anyone has questions. If you do have a question, please go ahead and submit it through the Q&A box um, and we will answer your question. And we'll just give you another minute or two. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So Lisa Marie, we will turn it back over to you to close us out. Thank you all for joining us today. As a reminder, the slide deck recording and transcript from today's support call will be available on the QPP webinar library within the next two weeks. Our next support call is scheduled for Wednesday, March 8th, 2023 from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern time, during which time we will cover frequently asked measure questions regarding PREV 6 and PREV 7. We hope you can join us. Thank you again for joining us today.